Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, hardening and tempering again, which is uh, a subject I've covered a little bit, um, but I uh, feel like there's still more depth to go into, uh, partly uh, due to some reading I've been doing recently, uh, and partly just because uh, when I've talked about it in the past, it's been kind of a quick overview. Um, so behind me here is uh, I, what's called, I believe, a CCT diagram, a continuous cooling transformation diagram. Um, and really what this does is it describes uh, what structures you can expect to get uh, while continuously cooling uh, your piece of steel. Uh, they are different for every steel. Um, and something that's not widely known, they are different depending on what temperature uh, you uh, austenitize at. So um, if you are, you know, in this case, I've written up here 1450. Uh, I'm going to be uh, doing some tests uh, in this video using 1075. 1450, 1475 um, is a pretty standard uh, austenitizing temperature for that steel. Um, now, why does uh, that temperature affect our diagram? Uh, we're going to get to that in a minute, because first I'm going to just quickly go over what you see in the diagram. Uh, so, as I said, we've got our austenitizing temperature. Right here we have what's often referred to as the nose of the curve, or simply the nose. It's what you need to avoid in order to get full martensite. Speaking of martensite, down here we have the, what's called MS, the martensite start, and MF, the martensite finish. These uh, typically, uh, for most uh, you know, fairly low alloy steels, MS starts um, you know, between 400 and 500 degrees. Uh, how fast you are quenching changes that uh, number. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors that go into it. Martensite finish also uh, is a factor of how fast you're quenching. It is also a factor of what your austenitizing temperature was. So, uh, there's a reason why uh, it is better for your steel and better for your final product to have a controlled austenitizing temperature rather than just quenching out of the forge. Uh, you know, for a lot of steels, quenching out of the forge works fine, um, but you will always have more variables in play in that scenario. Uh, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Uh, so. Um, depending on your austenitizing temperature, uh, you will put more or less carbon into solution. If you have a uh, eutectoid steel, so up to uh, in about 0.8% carbon, uh, or a hypo-eutectoid steel, um, which is to say uh, less than 0.8% carbon, um, as soon as you hit critical, uh, which I believe is about 1414 for most, uh, uh, most steels. Let me take a look at my chart over here. We're going to revise that. Uh, also, uh, the uh, A1, or critical, is actually uh, in the 1350 range. Uh, for plain carbon steels. Um, and uh, anybody who's curious what I was looking at, I have a previous video about the, uh, about the handy chart we've got on the wall, a uh, graph on the wall showing the different structures you have at different temperatures in the iron carbon uh, alloy mix. So um, in either case, so what happens in some steels, as you go into a higher and higher uh, austenitizing temperature, as you change uh, what you've got there. So in a uh, eutectoid steel, that 0.8% carbon, and 
key here, also still low alloy. As you start adding alloys, that changes the eutectoid point for steel. Uh, so adding chromium, for example, chain, you know, moves the eutectoid point, uh, I believe, to the left, which is to say a lower, uh, you know what, Phil? Skip that part, take that out. Um, that's, I'm not confident enough in that, so. Hi, Phil. So, uh, adding alloys changes the eutectoid point of your steel. So when you read, oh, this steel is a eutectoid steel, if it has alloying elements added to it, um, it's no longer, you know, and, and it's also still that roughly 0.8% carbon. It's no longer a eutectoid steel. Um, because, for example, let's say you add chromium or vanadium or molybdenum or any of the carbide forming elements, uh, they're going to form carbides. Uh, those carbides are much more resistant to dissolving um, at, uh, you know, as soon as you hit that, you know, what, what would normally be considered critical. Uh, so essentially, the uh, you know, how much carbon you are putting into solution uh, instantaneously at that point changes, at, you know, at that temperature, uh, that changes. Now, uh, what do those alloying elements do? Because they form more resilient carbides, they help control grain growth. Um, and that uh, allows you, in many ways, a bit more flexibility in your heat treat um, that, uh, you know, having those carbides there actually uh, prevents the austenite grains from growing larger. So you don't have to worry about grain growth as much. However, uh, the, the downside of this, kind of amusingly enough, is having carbides still in solution changes where this nose is. So that brings us, what's this nose? Uh, that nose is essentially, uh, if you pass through it, it's perlite. And why is it generally right around 900 degrees? It's because when you're cooling uh, fairly quickly, uh, the, uh, that, that's the temperature at which perlite uh, forms most quickly uh, or, or begins to form most quickly. Um, you know, so the, the problem with having a lot of carbides in solute, you know, a lot of carbides still in your mix, so you've got you know, you're up here, you've got uh, a mixture of austenite and uh, carbides. Um, those carbides all form nucleation points. And what they form nucleation points for is perlite. So when you have that fine scatter of uh, carbides throughout, um, this nose actually moves closer. This is why uh, you may have heard that uh, over refining your grain, having a super fine grain structure, uh, actually makes your steel less hardenable. And it's for a uh, sort of related reason, which is that the perlite, if it's not nucleating on a carbide, nucleates at the austenite grain boundaries. So the smaller those grain boundary, or the smaller those grains are, uh, the more surface area of grain boundary you've got, the faster that perlite uh, will nucleate and propagate. So that nose moves closer. So at the bottom here we have time. By the way, you should always be aware that on uh, almost all of these diagrams, time is a logarithmic scale. So you may have one second, 10 seconds, you know, a hundred seconds, a thousand seconds, then you get into hours and hundreds of hours, you know, it's, so it's a uh, very compressed view. This little section here, things happen fast. Uh, as you get further out, it takes forever. Um, also note, the scale is not going to be the same for all alloys. Uh, alloys that uh, are very hardenable, meaning they're very easy to harden, um, you know, where this nose is further over, that nose may actually be at 10 seconds or a minute, you know, perhaps for some of the air hardening steel. 
And uh, so they may change the scale. So keep an eye on that. Uh, the scale on these changes somewhat depending on uh, what your steel is. And, uh, you know, so you got to pay attention. So going back to our austenotizing temperature, the higher our temperature, the more of those carbides we put into solution. And once we've really started to put those carbides into solution, you know, we've broken them up, that carbon's gone into solution. Um, now we start to get grain growth. Both of those things together push the nose of our, uh, of our diagram over. That perlite nose pushes over, gives us a larger window to drop through for getting hardening. Now, don't think that means a higher austenitizing temperature and uh, breaking up all your carbides is always a good thing. It isn't always a good thing, but it's something to be aware of. If, you're ha if you have a steel that you're trying to harden and you're doing what you think is the correct, uh, you know, taking the correct steps to harden it, and it's just not hardening, uh, that austenitizing temperature may be a factor. Obviously, another factor could be what you're quenching in. Uh, you may not be quenching fast enough to miss that nose. Now, let's say you go through the nose just a little bit. Well, you're going to get some perlite and then go back to making, uh, you know, theoretically, assuming you get down here, making martensite. Um, so, this brings us to the martensite start and martensite finish. Um, the austenitizing temperature affects martensite finish, not in all steels, but in the higher carbon steels. Um, you know, so once you're getting up above the eutectoid, you're getting into hyper eutectoid steels. So let's say, uh, just for fun, let's say uh, W1 or W2. My, uh, you know, I have options at that point in uh, what austenitizing temperature I'm going to use and therefore what structure I'm going to get. Uh, as, you know, at the bottom end of my uh, austenitizing temperature, um, those are both very simple steels, not a lot of alloy in there. It's mostly iron and carbon. You've got some manganese for uh, deeper hardening effects, but you don't have any real carbide formers. W2 has a little bit of vanadium in it, um, but not, not a huge amount by any means. Um, so we can, to some degree or another, pretend that they are just carbon steels. Uh, certainly W1 is. So as I hit uh, the low end of the uh, austenitizing temperature, you know, so getting into the 1350 uh, Fahrenheit kind of range, now what I'll do at that point is almost instantaneously, or you know, certainly very quickly, put roughly 0.8% uh, carbon into solution, leaving myself with a substantial volume of carbides. Um, now, depending on what I've done previously, these could be huge carbides, they could be little tiny carbides. Um, that, that's a factor of treatment prior to heat treatment. Uh, but, so if I put 0.8% carbon into solution, this will actually heat treat substantially like 1080 or maybe 1084. Uh, you know, my, the nose of my curve is going to be very similar. It'll be a little bit tighter, in fact, because I've got, I still have those dissolved carbides. Those dissolved carbides actually lower the hardenability of my steel because of the uh, perlite nucleation that we talked about. My martensite start and martensite finish, uh, this should be about 200 degrees, give or take. Um, again, you know, exact numbers are things you should go back to the diagrams for it because they will be different for different steels. Um, but if I now push that temperature up, if I quench from, let's say, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit, I will now have dissolved almost all of my carbides. Uh, in the case of W1, I believe we will have already dissolved all the carbides. Uh, W2, you may still have some of those vanadium carbides hanging around. There's not that many of them. So you've put a substantially larger uh, volume of your carbon into solution. Now, what that does 
uh, you've, you've made a more hardenable material, your nose has moved over some. There's fewer nucleation points. Uh, you've got a little bit more time for your quench. However, it pushes your martensite finish temperature downward. And this is a factor of how uh, martensite actually forms from austenite. The more carbon you have, you know, the, uh, the, the harder it is, in some sense, to form entirely martensite. Uh, and there's a reason for this. Uh, the more carbon you have, generally speaking, the harder your martensite is. Uh, this is why W2 is often considered to be kind of the gold standard for how hard your martensite will be, generally somewhere around uh, 67 Rockwell, uh, if you do it right. Uh, but what you start to get is uh, more, uh, you start to push this down. And martensite finish basically means you've converted entirely to martensite. Uh, so for like a lot of stainless steels, martensite finish is actually uh, well below zero, uh, which is why you have to do uh, a lot, you know, where you have to get into the liquid nitrogen or uh, dry ice treatments. But even for low alloy, very high carbon steels, some, you know, something like W2, what happens is all that extra carbon, when it gets trapped, when I quench and that carbon is trapped in the matrix, uh, you know, the steel's trying to go back to being ferrite, but there's no time to get rid of the carbon, no time for it to come out. So that puts the, uh, that matrix under uh, an enormous amount of strain. That strain translates to hardness, but it also causes it to be expanded uh, versus what it would want to be at room temperature. Now, what happens there is that essentially, uh, since each given area, you know, uh, as with all things, martensite starts in, you know, discrete spots. The whole thing doesn't go poink all at once. Uh, you start in spots and it propagates out from there. Now, where those come together, you know, where those, you know, sort of wave fronts of martensite transformation come together, uh, there's not actually space for the steel to expand anymore. So you will trap pockets of austenite that simply can't transform uh, to martensite because there's simply no room uh, in the matrix anymore. Um, what that means is what we call retained austenite. Uh, different steels have more or less trouble with retained austenite. Generally speaking, um, higher alloys cause more problems with retained austenite, um, and higher carbon contents create more problems with retained austenite. Uh, another interesting thing to note about that uh, level of expansion, how, you know, let's, let's say you're making a katana, how much carbon you put into solution is going to affect how much curvature you get. Uh, it's one reason or one theory oh, that I've read of why uh, low and medium carbon, well, maybe not low carbon, but uh, medium carbon steels such as 1050 is very hard or it's certainly more difficult to get a nice curvature in the blade. Uh, it's a lot easier to get a nice curvature in something like W2. Uh, so what do you do about that retained austenite? Uh, in uh, things like stainless steel, where that martensite finish has been pushed down uh, to sometimes, you know, minus 100 or further, uh, well, you got to get into cryogenic treatments. Um, in uh, in the case, or sub-zero or cryogenic treatments. They're, they're separate things. Uh, generally, the sub-zero treatment is, uh, you know, something equivalent to dry ice and alcohol in a bath. Hopefully not your own bathtub. Don't get in there. Um, be chilly. Uh, but that would be a sub-zero quench versus a cryogenic quench, which typically refers to liquid nitrogen, which is taking you down uh, much further. Um, in either case, 
You don't need to get into that for your standard steels. Uh, you know, something like W2, if you quench from too high a temperature, or I shouldn't say too high, you might be doing this on purpose. Uh, if you quench from a higher temperature and therefore have mar more carbon in solution, you will get some, let's say more, retained austenite. Uh, there's, uh, I, I have read places that you always have some retained austenite. Um, and the way to get that to kick over, you know, so you've made it hopefully below martensite finish. Martensite finish has been pushed down. It may have been pushed down uh, actually close to zero, uh, you know, which, hey, you can take care of that by putting this in your freezer. However, what I would suggest first is tempering, then perhaps doing a, you know, stick it in your freezer, tempering, maybe put it in your freezer again, tempering. Now this is why a repeated temper cycle actually helps most steels. Um, if I have any retained austenite, the main reason for that retained austenite is that compressive uh, strain, uh, keeping it from kicking over, from transforming into martensite. So that retained austenite can be a problem. If it transforms later, uh, A, it's, uh, now it's untempered martensite, and B, it's, you know, it's, it's shouldering its way in and really creating a lot of extra strain you maybe didn't want. Uh, so, if you temper this, what happens? Some of that carbon is released out of the matrix, becomes very, very fine uh, carbide precipitate uh, throughout the steel, uh, you know, very fine dispersion. Um, and that releases, you know, now that I've let some of that carbon out of where it's been trapped, things can shrink down a little bit. I've released some of that tension. That's why I lose some of the hardness. But that also makes more space for that retained austenite to now transform as I'm cooling again. Uh, your martensite finish temperature is going to be changing as you are uh, allowing that extra space. So, temper cycle number one, some of that retained austenite kicks over into martensite. That means you have to do at least temper cycle number two to temper that, uh, that new martensite. You know, there is a diminishing return to the number of temper cycles. You don't want to just keep going uh, forever with this. Um, but it's worth doing some testing in uh, different steels. Or in, you know, if you have a specific steel you like to use, doing some testing in that steel or talking to somebody who has done testing in that steel to, uh, to see if they've got a, a good temper cycle regimen to uh, make sure you're not running into retained austenite issues. Now, um, I had always thought of retained austenite as being an issue uh, almost strictly for you know, super high carbon or super high alloy steels. Uh, but really, the reading I've been doing indicates that a lot of it is simply the uh, higher carbon content, even in very low alloy steels, uh, can get you into trouble on that. So, um, hope this has been helpful. As always, you know, drop some comments uh, down below, and I'll try to get back to you on it. Uh, I will be uh, doing uh, hardening and tempering tests. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, because one thing I do want to test out, uh, because we do a lot of sword work, I'm going to be testing out that uh, the 500 degree uh, embrittlement you may have heard of. Uh, it's a effect in uh, mostly in carbon steels, but uh, in some of the alloy steels as well, where you develop um, actually higher brittleness, so uh, lower toughness as you're tempering uh, in the range, I believe it's between 500 and about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. So, we'll be doing a little testing on that and uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So, I've uh, got our lineup of kilns uh, all set up to do uh, the experiment I wanted to try out. So, uh, I have 
four pieces of 1075 uh, eighth inch stock uh, that I am austenitizing at 1475. Uh, the kiln came up to 1475. It's pretty, especially on uh, these ones, it's pretty common for them to overshoot a little bit and then undershoot a little bit and then kind of stabilize. Uh, what I like to do, uh, you know, at 1075 at this temperature, I don't need to leave it for a long soak, but I like to uh, let it do that overshoot, undershoot, come back, and then I'll start doing my quenching. Each time I'll let it come back to 1475 before I quench the next piece. Uh, I'm likely to get a little bit of difference between my pieces just because uh, the later ones will be in there longer. I will try to kind of account for that by then separating them between uh, the two uh, tempering kilns. Uh, other thing of note, we've got a nitrogen purge going on the kiln, on the austenitizing kiln, so decarb shouldn't be a major factor uh, in our test results. Uh, so this kiln uh, I'm going to have at uh, 375, uh, which is pretty common tempering temperature. Um, and again, it has overshot, so I'm going to give it a little bit of time to come back down. I'll obviously lose a little temperature just opening the door. Um, this one down here, I have it 500. So what we're going to find out is uh, how does our uh, strength uh, compare tempering at 375 versus 500 and on both of these I will also do uh, one that gets a single temper and a second one which gets a secondary temper so we'll see uh, what we get so I'm at temperature quenching commences Very exciting process, quenching. So, it is not uh, necessary to quench all the way to cold, but one thing you want to make sure you don't do, uh, especially when quenching a knife, you don't want to quench in such a way that you have brought your uh, edge uh, down below the martensite start, uh, so it has started to kick over into martensite, and then you know the the spine of the blade where you've got more mass perhaps hasn't crossed that threshold, um, and uh, and is still hot enough that it then begins tempering your martensite uh, in the edge. Uh, so you can actually uh, really have a self-defeating quench by having the spine of your blade still quite hot and your edge has kicked over or at least started to kick over into martensite. Um, it's one huge advantage of quenching into a uh, 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 something like molten salt or another, you know, maybe a hot oil got to be careful with hot oil, uh, but quenching in such a way that you are quenching down to just above the martensite start. Or alternatively, you're, you know, maybe you do uh, an oil or polymer quench to just into the martensite and then you go into your hot oil. So there's less chance, uh, you know, than that hot oil holding you above martensite Start. So if you bump down and come back up out of it, you'll probably get a little bit of bainite. Um, but uh, the advantage that has is now the rest of your steel, everything can even out at that temperature. That initial quench gets you past the perlite nose. Now you can even out at that temperature and then slow cool. You know, let's say you want martensite still, you can now slow cool through martensite, uh, you know, through the martensite start and finish, so down through that zone, uh, allowing a much more uh, reasonable and, and uh, you know, uh, low stress transformation.
Okay, so let's put this first one in 500. We are back up to 1475. Got some smokies. So, uh, quenching really should be a low excitement activity. Should not be uh, worried about giant flare ups and things like that. Um, key to that is getting the tongs, the hot portion of the tongs, completely submerged, the hot portion of the steel completely submerged. Uh, it's when you have hot steel and that oil smoke uh, combining to get a good opportunity for some flare up. Um, okay, this kiln has uh, evened out down in the 375 department. So, got the first one in at 375. This is still above. Oil on the tongs. So the reason I'm wearing the uh, face mask for this, uh, and the gloves for that matter, has less to do with uh, risk of flare up and more to do uh, with the chance of, as I'm quenching, uh, creating a splash. And that splash would be uh, very hot oil possibly, which I don't know about you, but I don't think that sounds all that fun. Mm -hmm. Still going. So this one I'll also put in the 500. Uh, and what we'll be doing to test these is uh, just a bend test, essentially. I'll put them in the vise, uh, latch onto them with some vise grips, and see how far we got to go. So not super scientific, but um, I think at least could be uh, revealing. Like I said, not super scientific. If we were being really scientific about this, uh, we would need a lot more samples. Um, so that, you know, if I'm screwing up my process here somewhere, uh, it would get evened out. We'd, we'd see where the outliers are, uh, toss out those data points. So. you're able to see the color of this steel as I'm coming out of the uh, kiln. Uh, critical is not nearly as hot as uh, we often think it is, visually speaking. Um, so 1475, which is, you know, pretty solidly into you know, above the A1 or austenite, you know, sort of that, uh, the, the bottom of the uh, austenite zone. Um, like I was pointing out before, that's, that's more like 1350. It's in that range. Um, so 1475, we are well into that and um, shouldn't be having any issues with our austenites. Is it austenite? Whatever. I'm going to give up on that one. Nobody likes saying that word. Okay. Last one's going into uh, the 375. Woohoo! Smoke. I love smoke. Uh, so, uh, what I will be doing with these is that in both cases, one uh, sample will get a single temper for, say, two hours. The other one, I'll be breaking that up uh, about halfway through, uh, take the steel out, 
uh, cool it back to room temperature and then do a second temper cycle on it. So uh, we'll see uh, what effect we have here and uh, get back to you in a minute. 375, one temper cycle. Jesus Christ! <laughs> 375, one temper, second attempt. Five hundred, uh, one temper cycle. I don't know. Not sure. There we go. Boom. Three seventy five, two temper cycles. Oh, I got the wall. Broke about the same. 500, two temper cycles. Interesting. That broke way sooner. So, what did our testing tell us? Uh, I don't know. Hard to draw too many conclusions from it. Overall, the, uh, the 500 degree tempers seem to have uh, bent substantially further. Uh, before breaking. I would say that the, uh, the tempering at 375 bent farther than I was expecting before breaking. Um, so that's good. Uh, grain structure on all of these looks great. So 1475 is my austenitizing temperature for 1075. Uh, we now have some good support for uh, that quenching temperature. And beyond that, I can't say that I've put to rest uh, too much about the uh, temper embrittlement uh, aspect of, you know, that theoretical 500 degree embrittling range. However, um, at least as in terms of flex tests, I don't think we saw embrittlement. Would that hold up, uh, you know, would, the, would we get the same results if we were doing some kind of impact test, hard to say, and an impact test isn't something we can really do scientifically uh, with our equipment here. So, uh, you know, that, that's something more for a lab, and well, we're cheap, so we're not gonna pay a lab to do that. Hope this was informative and uh, mildly enjoyable watching things fly, and we'll uh, catch you next time.